And so now we have blood spilling out and we have lost some oxygen. Our oxygen has now left with our blood. Hopefully this video will help explain some things about the physiology that happens in the human body. If you find this helpful, leave a like on the video. That helps us out as well. Subscribe to our channel so you can see future videos that we post and turn your notifications on so you get an alert so that you know when we've posted new content. And if you're looking for trauma supplies or medical kits or even diagnostic tools, head over to our website at sixechosystems.com and check out some of our products there. Welcome to part one of our physiology series. So we're gonna be talking about specifically ventilation, respiration, gas exchange, normal breathing, circulatory, blood going around your body type stuff. So this is important when you're starting to treat and assess patients, whether it's a medical patient or a trauma patient, because understanding these basic concepts allows you to have a better grasp of what's actually going on in that emergency so you know better how to treat patients, and if you're doing something that's just a skill like applying a tourniquet, you now actually understand what you're doing by applying that tourniquet or that chest seal and how that is making a difference in the patient. The more you understand this baseline, the better off you're gonna be when you're trying to do these skills and assessments to patients. So let's start off going over some basic anatomy. And we're gonna talk about anatomy specifically pertaining to the pulmonary, cardiac, and circulatory systems. Now when I say pulmonary, I mean lungs. Cardiac, I mean heart and circulatory. We're talking about the uh, circulation system that the blood moves through the body. So lungs, heart, and blood. Now in the lungs, we're going to use our lungs to draw air from the ambient air into our lungs to breathe. So we have 21% oxygen in the ambient air. I take a deep breath in, my chest wall expands, my diaphragm goes down, and it creates a negative pressure to draw air from the outside in. That 21% oxygen in the air then goes through that air into my lungs. It goes through either my nose or my mouth, through the nasopharynx or the oropharynx, it goes to the back of the throat, which is the pharynx. It then goes down through the trachea or the windpipe. It then branches off down in my chest and goes into the bronchi and then splits off into a bunch of smaller airways called the bronchioles. And then goes from there into little grape-like sacs called alveoli. Those alveoli are small little sacs that um, the air moves into, and that's where the gas exchange takes place. All that gas that's in the ambient air gets moved into the bloodstream. The bloodstream, in return, gets rid of some of its gas, and then you exhale, and all that works its way back out. Now let's talk about the blood. So the blood is in a closed system in a bunch of tubes that we call vessels. These vessels are broken up in two categories, arteries and veins. Arteries run away from the heart or go out from the heart. So the heart pumps through arteries and then that blood goes through capillaries, which are real small vessels. And those capillaries are where the gas exchange takes place. They have thin membranes that allow gas to move through them. And then they return back to the heart through the venous system or through veins. So arteries and veins and capillaries. So let's follow the blood for a minute. So we're gonna start in the right side of the heart. There's blood in the right side of the heart. The heart contracts and pumps and it pushes and propels that blood out through those uh, through the arteries. So it goes through the pulmonary artery first. It goes through the pulmonary artery. It goes to the lungs in capillaries that are all over those alveoli we just talked about. And that is where the oxygen in our lungs now goes through the membrane wall, absorbs into the blood. The blood continues past that. It goes to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary vein, comes into the heart. The heart squeezes and pumps again. The blood is then propelled out through the circulatory system to the rest of the body to give oxygen to the cells that need it. The cells then give off carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide comes back through the veins, the veins come back to the right side of the heart and start that process all over again. One of the main goals that we're trying to achieve with this complicated system is getting oxygen from the ambient air down into our cells. Our cells need oxygen to survive. If they don't get oxygen, they start to die, and dying cells means a dying patient, and that's not a good thing. So, as we are looking at this oxygen moving from the ambient air and getting it down to the cells, there's four main parts of the process we're gonna look at. Ventilation, exterior respiration, interior respiration, and metabolism in the cell itself. So I have this little 
demonstration set up. So hopefully it will help you visualize what's happening with the oxygenation, respiration, and metabolism. So first off, we have our dude. So our dude is gonna breathe air in, it goes into his lungs. From there, we have this red train track, work with me here. This is a red train track that represents our arteries. So our arteries carry oxygenated blood, which is typically more bright red than venous blood. So this bright red is gonna be our arteries. Transports blood away from the heart into the cells. Here we have our fine cells with some metabolism going on and you can see the energy and the smoke that is a byproduct of our current metabolism in our cells here. Once we leave the cells, we have the blood that goes through our capillaries in the cells and it returns through this darker colored, purple or blue, venous structures, comes through the veins back to the heart, and then goes back through to pick up more oxygen in the lungs and back around again and again. So we have our anatomical structures of the person here, we have our artery, we have our cells represented by our little lamp here, and then we have our venous return. So these are our pathways or our railways that our hemoglobin will transport in. I have a red blood cell here. So the red blood cell is comprised of some proteins called hemoglobin. Those hemoglobin have four seats or four spots for oxygen to bind to. Now, there's like 300 million hemoglobin on a red blood cell. So this is not accurate that a red blood cell would have four molecules of oxygen. It's actually gonna have a lot more than that, but because the hemoglobin has four spots, we put four spots on here. Think of this though as a rail car. So the rail car is gonna start at the lungs. It can now hold oxygen. So these white balls are gonna represent our oxygen. This is a rail car. We're gonna move our rail car along the tracks and back to the body. And then we're gonna be transporting our cargo today, which is oxygen. Let's start from the top and let's track this all the way through as it comes back. Okay, remember those four things we talked about? Ventilation, exterior respiration, interior respiration, and then metabolism. So ventilation is literally air moving in and out. When your chest expands and then contracts and goes back and forth, that allows air to move in and out. That's what we call ventilation. It has nothing to do with oxygen or anything else. It's just air movement. So we have ventilation going on. Then we have exterior respiration. Respiration is gas exchange. So now we have whatever gas is in those lungs. It could be poisonous gas, it could be ambient air, it could be straight up 100% oxygen with someone that's on a medical mask. So we have whatever gas is in those lungs is now getting moved into the bloodstream. That process is called respiration and this is the exterior respiration because it's happening at the lungs. Now it goes into the bloodstream, it transports through the bloodstream and it ends up at the cells. Once it gets to the cells, we have what's called an interior respiration. Again, just a gas exchange. Whatever gas has got absorbed in the bloodstream are now getting dumped over into the cells. Now the cells can do what they will with that, which is typically metabolism if it's healthy air and gases that they're getting like oxygen. So if they get oxygen, that oxygen acts as a fuel for the metabolism fire and those cells are gonna produce energy off of that and we call that metabolism. The cells actually producing that energy is called metabolism. So we have ventilation, air moving in and out, exterior respiration, which is gas exchange into the bloodstream. The bloodstream then transports that. Then we have interior respiration, which is where the cells take that gas. And then the cells themselves actually produce energy. And that is called metabolism. So those are the four parts that we're gonna keep in mind as we work through this. So let's trace some oxygen around through our system here. We have 21% oxygen in ambient air. It's really like 20.9 but we're gonna round up to 21. So we have 21% oxygen in the air. So in this air that's floating around right now, we have some oxygen molecules. Our dude breathes in, he takes fresh air, hopefully it's fresh, takes fresh air into his lungs and there's some oxygen in there. There's a higher percentage of oxygen in his lungs than there is in the blood that's present in the capillaries in his lungs. So that is just naturally gonna dissolve into the blood. So we have these little red blood cells that are gonna now get some oxygen bound to them. Oxygen sticks to these red blood cells and the heart is constantly pumping, so they start moving. So this little train car gets all the way to the cells where it needs to go and it goes to some more capillaries and it's near these cells that need to be oxygenated and this oxygen gets dumped into our cells as fuel for the metabolism fire. Now, our cells are now burning oxygen and glucose 
and they are creating this metabolism and are creating energy through metabolism. And as it produces energy, that's what gives us the energy we need. But we have this smoke that is coming off of this fire and that smoke is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a byproduct of that metabolism. So now we've got this smoke, this little blood comes through to our venous side, works its way through the capillaries. Now it's on the venous side, heading back to the lungs to get more oxygen, but it's going to pick up some of the smoke along the way and get rid of it. So it's got some carbon dioxide that jumped on board and it's now going to take this all the way back out. Now, if you're getting technical, I know carbon dioxide, only 10% of carbon dioxide actually sticks to the hemoglobin. Um, the rest of it's just kind of dissolved in the plasma, but either way, the bloodstream is now carrying this back. So it works its way all the way back, jumps back into the lungs. You exhale, let all that air out. It goes through the lungs and it gets expelled back out into the air. Take that next breath in, oxygen comes back in, binds to this car, and hopefully if we have good oxygen, we will fill up the majority of these seats and it takes off and we get more oxygen and it fills up and it takes off. And then we start this whole process of filling up all these little train cars with oxygen, sending them to the cells. The cells then burn it up and then this blood transports through as it dumps that off. It picks up some carbon dioxide and sends it back to be exhaled. That's our process for ventilation, respiration, and metabolism. So how does all this apply to us? Well, let's run through a couple scenarios to show how this applies to the emergencies we may be assisting with. First off, let's talk about an overdose. So someone has a narcotic overdose. Narcotics decrease your respiratory drive and really what that's doing, it basically means that you can't ventilate anymore. So your lungs don't want to open and close. It doesn't mess with the heart transporting blood. It just means your lungs don't want to go in and out. If air is not going in and out, your lungs are not expanding and contracting. There's no air movement. So this 21% oxygen is not getting into the lungs. So it's just hanging out here in outer space, not happening anything. Our hemoglobin are still going around. Heart's still pumping. We still have blood transporting. We still have all these little rail cars on the train track. And they're coming around, but they have no oxygen. So they can't feed the fire. So we're not getting any fuel to the fire. They jump back here and they come back and they go through and they come back and they go through and they come back. And we're not getting any fuel to the fire because we're not actually mechanically ventilating to get oxygen into the lungs, to the bloodstream. So meanwhile, all our cells start dying and this fire is going out because we don't have the oxygen pushing to those cells to keep them alive. So. We don't have an issue with the blood. The blood transport system, our train cars are still going round and round, but we simply don't have a way to get that oxygen from ambient air into the lungs. So one thing we can do for these patients, obviously everyone is talking about Narcan, but really the real fix for this um, instantly is we can start breathing for them. We have a BVM, we start breathing for them, we start doing the work of those lungs by pushing air into there. And as we start introducing fresh air and pushing it down into the lungs, now we get oxygen starting to bind again. So now we have cars that start to have oxygen bound to them and we start filling up those train cars again as we start providing fuel to our cells. In this scenario, let's say that we had a severe arterial bleed. Remember this red is our artery right here. So that has been severed. We've had a gunshot wound. We've had a uh, traumatic injury that has severed an artery in some form or fashion. And so now we have blood spilling out and we have lost some oxygen. So our oxygen has now left with our blood. We don't have a problem with the air coming in and out, but we have an issue with the amount of transporters we have to get oxygen around. So we've got this lonely little guy that's now going around. We've got a couple more helping them. That comes out and we get plenty of oxygen on these, but we don't have near as many of these as we did because several of them have now disappeared. So we have plenty of oxygen. Oxygen is getting to the hemoglobin. It's on there. It's going around. It's still feeding the fire, but we don't have near as many as we did because we've lost that blood. So that's why it's important to get a tourniquet on these 
people or wound pack or do whatever you have to do to stop that bleeding so we keep as many of these little train cars in the body as possible and we don't lose any more than we have to. Because once we do that, if we give IV fluids or anything except for a blood transfusion, these patients still are lacking in the little train cars to get oxygen to the cells. If we don't have enough of these, those cells die and that person ends up dying. So we have to keep that blood inside the body. So let's say our dude had a heart attack. The heart is the pump that makes all this blood go around and around. So he may be getting oxygen in, oxygen gets to the hemoglobin, but now the heart is having problems pumping. So now this hemoglobin is going really slow. We may have decreased blood pressure. We may have a decreased heart rate. Our heart rate may go from 80 down to 40. Depends on exactly what's affected in the heart and how that plays out. But let's say we have these, but they're going really slow. And so it's taking a longer time for oxygen to actually get to those cells. So that's now we have a pump problem. The pump cannot push all this around and we start to have a lot more issues out of that. So that's kind of how the heart attack or a significant cardiac problem would affect the system. And if that heart attack progresses to a full cardiac arrest, which literally means the heart stops, these hemoglobin that have oxygen on them stop dead in their tracks and they cannot get to the cells that still need that oxygen. That's why we have to immediately begin on chest compressions. We now take over the job of the heart and continue to push that blood to the cells where it needs to be. In this scenario, we're gonna say that we had penetrating trauma to the chest. We have a collapsed lung on that side. We have a complete collapsed lung on one side. So now the only gas exchange or the only ventilation and respiration that's taking place is in the opposite lung. So we have right lung collapsed, left lung is still intact and in play. Well, the problem is the blood that is now getting sent to this lung is not getting oxygenated because it's collapsed. The blood that's coming to this side is still getting oxygen. So we have some blood that has oxygen, some blood that doesn't but we're still decreasing our total capacity of oxygen that's making it to the cells. These cells still need oxygen to live. We can still survive for a while off of one lung. So we have decreased oxygen, but we still need to take care of these patients because we know that they have an issue with getting that oxygen in because they're only working off half a lung. So additional oxygen would be a good idea for them. Supplemental oxygen with a, uh, non-rebreather or some t sort of oxygen delivery device would be a good idea. We also want to make sure that we cover up this hole to help try to reinflate that lung. And if we can get that lung reinflated to some degree with a chest seal, we can potentially start adding a little bit of oxygen in some of this other lung. So now we've added to the amount of oxygen we have to deliver to those cells. So that is a complicated system that we have tried to simplify down for you as far as some of the physiology that we are dealing with on a regular day. It's amazing the amount of things that go on in the human body on a regular basis that we don't even think about. We have an amazing creator that has created our bodies to be able to do these complicated things that it takes us a while to even begin to comprehend. So hopefully this helped break this down for you and gave you a better understanding of some of these things. So now you can apply them in your assessments and your treatment and make you a better provider for those that are sick and injured. If you have any thoughts or feedback on this video or any other questions that you need answered, please leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.